I have often time mentioned that there are certain promises in the Bible that I'm not too happy about. God has promised that they who live righteously in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Bible promises many are the afflictions of the righteous. Now, I am not too wild about those promises. But there are other promises in the Bible that I am just thrilled about. And as we begin our study tonight, here in Romans chapter 6, we come to one of those promises that to me is just such a thrill and a blessing. Verse 14, God has promised, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin will not rule over you. What a glorious promise this is. I can be free from the dominion of sin in my life. God has promised me that sin would not have dominion over me. To whom was this promise made? Those who are dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Those who have reckoned the old man to be dead with Christ. To those who have taken this position of faith, I am dead unto sin but alive unto God. Sin will not have dominion, cannot have dominion over them. That does not mean that I'm perfect. But it does mean that sin no longer rules over me. The Bible, I do not believe, teaches the doctrine of sinless perfection. I think that as long as we are in these bodies that we're going to find ourselves not necessarily willingly but inadvertently missing the mark, sinning. In fact, in John, writing to the believers, he said, if you say you have no sin, you're only deceiving yourself. You're surely not deceiving your wife or the rest of the family. You're deceiving yourself and the truth isn't in you. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So to those who are yielding their bodies, their members as instruments of righteousness unto God, sin will not have dominion over them. This, of course cannot be said of the unregenerate at all. The unregenerate is a slave, a servant to sin. He sins because he cannot stop sinning. It rules over his life. Bear witness to how many people today are bound by some sin and are spending thousands of dollars to be freed from that sin. I think of all of the people that are going through various types of cures for drug addiction, alcoholism, who realize that they are bound by these things. They are slaves to it. They hate it. They don't want it. They're miserable in it. And they're spending thousands of dollars in these rehabilitation centers trying to get free from the power of sin. But the Lord comes to us with a glorious gospel to set us free from that power of sin. And God proclaims to you, 
for sin shall not have dominion over you. By virtue of what basis? The basis that you are no longer under law, but under grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. This not under law is not a reference to the Ten Commandments. The Gentiles were never under the Mosaic law. It was a covenant that God had established with the nation Israel whereby they might relate to him. There came quite an issue in the early church. In fact, one of the first major issues that the early church faced was the relationship of the Gentile believers to the Mosaic law. The early church began as a Jewish institution. Those who realized that Jesus was the promised Messiah, they did not cease being Jews when they received Jesus as their Messiah. They continued in the temple worship. You remember that Peter and John were going into the temple at the hour of prayer when the lame man was uh, there seeking alms. They continued in all of their Jewish traditional practices. They observed Sabbath. And they observed the uh, various aspects of the Jewish faith. They observed the feast days. In fact, Paul was anxious to get back to Jerusalem that he might celebrate the feast back there. And it was just a, a part of their whole existence, that Jewish culture. They did not cease being Jews when they embraced Jesus Christ. This is a common fallacy among the Jews who today feel that to become a Christian means to cease being a Jew. That is not at all true. And if you'll study the history of Christianity, you'll find that it began totally and strictly among the Jews. And they were not even willing at the beginning to include the Gentiles within their ranks. When the Lord called Peter to go to the house of Cornelius, he was very reluctant to do so. It was only in obedience to God that he went. And when he got there, he apologized for being there. He said, now I really didn't want to come and, uh, you know, I, I, I have no business being in your house because I'm a Jew. But God told me not to call anything unclean that he had cleansed. So I've come down. But then he was thankful that he had other witnesses with him. So when he went back to the church to face the music, why did you go to the Gentiles? He could let them know that God was working among the Gentiles, even as he did among the Jews. But it was sort of an apology to the church in Jerusalem as Paul returned, I mean, as Peter returned and told them what had happened among the Gentiles. Who am I that I can resist the work of God? I was just there and the Holy Spirit fell on me. I couldn't do anything, to, you know. It's not, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. Now, Paul the Apostle was really the first of the Jews to really see the fullness of the grace of God and its implications. For if a man is saved by grace, then it cannot be by works. If a man is saved by works, then it cannot be by grace. Grace and works are mutually exclusive as a means of righteousness. Now, 
It does not mean that a man who is saved does not work or does not have works of righteousness. But the works of righteousness are the result of that righteousness that he now has imparted to him through the work of God's Holy Spirit through grace. It is not the works that make him righteous. The works spring forth from that righteousness that has now been imparted to him by his faith in Jesus Christ. So if it is of works, then grace is eliminated. That is the righteous standing before God. Paul was the first to really see this, and he proclaimed it among the Gentiles. And as Paul went out to the Gentiles, he preached Christ unto them, Christ crucified. Paul did not preach unto them the Mosaic law. He did not speak to them of the ordinances of the Mosaic law. But he preached the righteousness which is by grace through faith. That they can have a righteous standing before God by believing in Jesus Christ. And there were there were no attempts by Paul to put the Mosaic law on the Gentile believers. And that is what became the issue in the early church when certain of the brethren from the church in Jerusalem, which was strictly a Jewish body of believers, they heard of the work of God down in Antioch, so they decided to go down to Antioch to visit. And when they saw these Gentile believers worshiping Jesus Christ, loving the Lord, and yet not observing those traditional aspects of the Jewish faith, they began to say, look, this is terrible. You say that you're born again, but you can't be saved unless you keep the law of Moses and you're circumcised. And so when Paul got wind of what these fellows were teaching, he got hold of them. And he said, now look, let's go back to Jerusalem and let's settle this issue once and for all. And so they came back to Jerusalem with these men who had brought division to the church in Antioch. And the early church called its first council. And the issue was what relationship the Gentile believers had to the law. And out of that council came the conclusion that the Gentile believers had no relationship to the law of Moses. And they did not seek to put the Gentile church under the law of Moses, but commended them to the grace of God. Now, Whenever you speak of the law and righteousness by the law, you are speaking of works because that's what it's all about. It involves your obedience to the law in order to be righteous. But it goes a step further than that. It requires your obedience to all the laws in order to be righteous. For if a man keeps the whole law, yet he violates in one point, he's guilty of all. It goes one step further than that. It involves your keeping of the whole law at all time throughout your entire life in order to be righteous by the law. And if at any time in your life you should violate one point of the law, then you're through. The law can do nothing more for you but condemn you.
That is why the scripture said the law made nothing perfect. No one was able to achieve righteousness by the law. Paul tells us that if a person could be righteous by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If a person could live a perfect life, if a person could live a sinless life by obedience to the law, then Christ died in vain. But no one can. Because we are by nature the children of wrath even as others. So, we are not under law. And because I am not under the law, where there is no law, there is no transgression. So, sin has no chance to rule over me because I'm not under the law, but I am under grace. My relationship with God is not premised upon my works, but my relationship with God is premised upon His work in sending his son who died in my place for my sin and for my guilt, whose righteousness is imparted to me by my believing in him. And God's grace then extends towards me through my faith in Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God, I am accounted righteous before God. Now, when Paul is saying you are not under law, but under grace, this reference here is not even a reference to the Mosaic law. As I said, the Gentiles were never under it. But he is talking about law as a principle. For it seems that it is so difficult in our minds to alienate the thought of being righteous apart from keeping rules and ordinances. So within the church, there has been established certain laws, regulations, rules. And as a child growing up, they had all the do's and all the don'ts that I had to do or not do in order to be righteous before God. And I was seeking for years to be righteous before God on the basis of what I wasn't doing and what I was doing. And these rules were just a substitute for the Mosaic Law, really. And I about destroyed myself trying to keep the rules in order that I might be righteous before God. I about destroyed myself because I was constantly under the pressure of guilt because I was always breaking the rules. I didn't read my Bible as much as they said I was supposed to. I didn't pray as much as they said I was supposed to. I didn't witness as much as they said I was supposed to. I didn't go to shows. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I was pretty good in those areas. But... It was a whole negative kind of a relationship with God. I was righteous because I didn't do these sinful things. I did not know 
or understand, nor was I ever taught or showed the righteous standing that I could have before God through faith and by the grace of God. And so I was always seeking to work to be accepted by God. To be good in order that God could accept me. To be faithful so that God could reward me. And I had a legal relationship with God because I was trying to observe the law, not of Moses, but the law of the church that had been imposed upon me. And one day, after years in the ministry, as I was studying and reading the book of Romans, the grace of God broke over my heart and it was the greatest experience that I had ever had in my relationships with God. My life was transformed. My life was changed when I came to this place of realizing that sin was not to have dominion over me, could not have dominion over me, because I'm not under law, but under grace. And to come from a legal relationship with God to a loving relationship with God was the greatest thing that ever happened in my whole Christian experience. I'm serious. I don't even remember when I was born again. You know, a lot of people, that's a great experience for them, being born again. But I was steeped in the scriptures from the time I could talk. My mother started me memorizing scriptures when I was first able to speak. Some of my first sentences were Bible verses. She taught me to read when I was four years old using the Bible, and I would sit there and read the Bible to her while she was doing her ironing. And I'd get to those long names, and I'd spell them out for her, and she would pronounce them. But, I mean, I grew up with it. I can't remember a time when I wasn't saved. I can't remember a time when I didn't believe totally in Jesus Christ. I was dedicated when I was 13 days old and I was baptized in water when I was 7 years old after the pastor was sort of reluctant to do it but he examined me and questioned me on baptism. I was able to quote the scriptures to him and everything else and, and he, uh, because man, I could quote scriptures from the time I was a little kid. And he said, well, you know more than most of the adults do about it and so he baptized me. I had received the empowering of the Holy Spirit in my life. And that was an experience that I do remember. And at that point, I committed my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But really, when I discovered I wasn't under law but under grace, that was the greatest thing that ever happened in my whole spiritual walk. I mean... That was the most liberating experience, the most joyful thing that I had ever experienced in my relationship with God. I no longer had a legal relationship with God. I now had a total loving relationship with Him. And I came into the love of God like I'd never known before. I came into the grace of God that I had never understood before. And God just broke over my heart His glorious grace and love. And really, for the first time, I really began to understand that God loved me. You see, I used to think that He was half the time at least angry with me because of my failures, because I wasn't keeping the rules as I should. 
And so many times I'd go to church and the sermon would just put me under condemnation. And I was sure that God was angry with me because the minister seemed to be angry with me. <laughs> he was yelling at me <laughs> and telling me how awful I was. And I knew he was right. And he represented God to me. And so I thought of God as being totally disgusted with me, angry with me, ready to kick me out. In fact, I was sure a lot of times that he had kicked me out. I came begging to get back in. But oh, if you've not been through that experience, you don't understand what it is for a person who has sought all of his life to be righteous before God by his works and by his efforts and by his deeds. And, and to be so painfully aware of your weaknesses and your shortcomings. And to have such a tenuous relationship with God that is based upon my goodness and my righteousness and my obedience. And you don't know what it is for a person who has labored all of his life under that kind of a relationship to discover that God loves me. And he loved me all the while. And he understood my failures. And he wasn't ready to throw me out. But he wanted to help me and strengthen me. And he was making available to me his resources in order that I might be strengthened and helped. And I'll tell you, in coming into the grace of God, I was set free. You're not under law, but you're under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Isn't it interesting how so many people like to find some excuse to sin? When in the previous chapter, Paul talked again about the grace of God saying, where sin abounded, grace did overflow. Then they were saying, oh, well then let's go out and sin freely that grace may overflow. Oh, you know, frustrating. <laughs> the desire that some people have to sin. Just looking for some excuse. And so here, oh, if we're not under law but under grace, then what, shall we then just go out and sin because we are not under law but under grace? And Paul responds in the same way that he did to the last suggestion of sinning freely that grace may overflow. God forbid. Perish the thought. God didn't set us free to go out and sin. God has brought us into this new relationship that we might have power over sin. That sin would not have dominion over you. As long as you were under the law, sin could have dominion over you. But now that we relate to God through grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, and now that we have that righteousness of Christ imparted to us, now that we are dead unto sin but alive unto God, not under law but under grace, sin cannot have dominion over us. It is not a license. Grace is never a license to sin and should never be looked upon as such or thought upon as such. Now Paul said, God forbid, because don't you know that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Now, if I yield my body as an instrument of sin, then I become a servant of sin. I come under its power. This is what happened to Eve 
and subsequently to Adam in the garden. They yielded themselves to the obedience of Satan's suggestion. As God had given to them the freedom in the garden, freedom of choice, and had given them the choice by placing the tree there, giving them the freedom of eating of all of the trees with the exception of the one, but putting that one there in order that there might be a choice, in order that there might be validity to the fact that man had the capacity of choice. Because the capacity of choice is of no value unless there's a choice to be made. And so the necessity for that tree, in order that man's capacity of choice might be valid. As Satan came along and suggested that they eat of that tree, declaring to them or to Eve the benefits of eating of that tree, when she yielded herself to obey the suggestion of Satan and to eat of that tree, when she ate and when she gave to Adam and he ate, in yielding themselves to Satan's suggestion, they became the servants of Satan. For to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you become. You see, in their action, it was not an action simply of disobedience to God. But in their disobedience to God, there was the obedience to Satan. It was a double action, and all sin involves a double activity. It is disobedience to God on the one hand, but in the same token, it is obedience to Satan's suggestions. So to whomever you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you become. Now we were told in the last lesson to yield our members as instruments unto righteousness. If I yield myself unto God, to obedience to God, the obedience of faith by believing and trusting in Him, by yielding myself to obey to God, I become God's servant. But if I am yielding myself to the suggestions of Satan to disobey God, to live after the flesh, to indulge the flesh, then I am becoming the servant of Satan because I am obeying his suggestions. And Paul is seeking to point this out. Don't you realize that whoever you yield yourself a servant to obey, his servant you become. Works both ways. You can yield your body, the instruments of your body, uh, unto Satan, to obey Satan in the rebellion against God, and you become a servant of Satan. Or you can yield your body, your life, into obedience of faith unto God, and you become God's servant. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, Yes, we were. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Yes, at one time we had yielded ourselves to the suggestions of Satan. We had followed his path. We became his slaves. We were servants to sin. But thank God, having now obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered, which of course is the grace of God imparted to us by our faith and believing in Jesus, 
we were then made free from sin. So we go back, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Having yielded ourselves in obedience to God, we've become free from that power that once held sway in our lives. We've become free from sin which was once our tyrant ruling over us. And now we are free from that power that we might serve God in the Spirit, obeying God's Word and God's truth from the heart. Paul said, I speak after the manner of men because of the weakness of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. One time you had yielded your body as an instrument unto uncleanness, to sin. You see, here and again is the capacity of choice. You can choose to rebel against God if you desire. You can choose to follow Satan's rebellion or you can choose to serve God. Joshua called unto the people to choose who they would serve. And he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Later, Elijah the prophet called unto the people saying, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. If the Lord is God, then serve him. And if Baal is God, then serve him. Each man has that capacity of choice and does exercise that power of choice. For I choose to yield my life to God and to the Holy Spirit and to that force and power of God within my life unto righteousness and obedience to Him. Or I can choose to yield my body as an instrument unto sin, to follow Satan's suggestion, to live after my body appetite. To seek to fulfill the desires of my mind and heart. Living after my flesh. I can live after the flesh or I can live after the spirit. It is my choice to make. And if I choose to live after the spirit, then sin cannot have dominion over me any longer. Paul said, I speak after the manner of men because of the weakness of your flesh. And we're all of us too painfully aware of the weakness of our flesh. However, in the same way that you yielded yourself to the flesh, you can yield yourself to the Spirit. It's your choice. In the morning when you wake up, you can decide, well, I'm going to just yield myself to the flesh and I'm just going to follow after my own desires and I'm going to just, you know, try and just fulfill the desires of my flesh today. I'm just going to give in and, you know, live after the flesh. Or, as you wake up, you can say, I just choose today to yield my life to the Spirit of God to live in the Spirit, to walk after the Spirit. And whosoever I yield myself servants to obey, his servants I become. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what fruit did you have in those things whereof you are now ashamed? What do you have to show for that life of the flesh, those things that you did 
that you're so ashamed of now. For the end of those things is death. Spiritual, ultimately physical. But now being made free from sin. Notice this again. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Being then made free from sin, verse 18. And again in verse 22. But now being made free from sin. God has set you free from the power of sin. Realize that. And you've become the servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now my life of sin, the fruit of that life of sin, was emptiness, frustration. And the result and the end result of sin is death. But in yielding myself as a servant of God, the fruit of that is the holy life. I see God's work in me. I see as God is just cleaning up a lot of areas. I see as God is changing me and transforming me into the image of Christ. I see the fruit of God's work in my life. I see the love. I've experienced the joy. I have that peace. And I see God working in me and I see this glorious fruit of righteousness that God is working in my life. And the end of this whole thing is everlasting life. When God is through, the glorious end result will be everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Again, wages. Wages are always related to works. Works are always related to the law and to the flesh. Gifts are not related to works. Gifts are related to grace. Now, the wages of sin, death. The gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We'll get into this a little bit next week before we move on into chapter 7. Father, we thank you for the glorious work of thy spirit in our hearts and lives. And we thank you, Father, that we relate to you through grace. That you have done the work. You have accomplished our salvation. And all we must do is believe and receive your work of grace in our hearts and lives just yielding ourselves, Lord, to you, yielding ourselves to the Spirit, thank you, Father, for the glorious freedom that you have given us over the power of sin that once held us as a captive and slave. Thank you, Father, for setting us free. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord, by his Holy Spirit, implant his word upon your heart and his truth. May the Spirit bear witness to it and teach you that you might experience a loving relationship with God through grace. And experience that fullness of God's love and grace towards you through Jesus Christ our Lord. 